Well, I'm excited to talk to you about rolled away. Before we do, though, I got to tell you my Easter joke. You all with me? I'm here ready for a little laugh or at least a little bit of compassion. All right, here we go. So kind of ties in. In Indiana, there is a cemetery, and at that cemetery lies a tombstone which reads, pause, stranger, when you pass me by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. An unknown passerby saw it, read the words, and scratched these words below. To follow you, I am not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> Come on, somebody say amen. amen. But how many know because of Easter, we know which way we're going because Jesus died and he rose again. I want to invite all our locations. If you have a Bible, turn with me. If you're here, you can join me. We're going to go to Mark chapter 16, verse 3 and 4. And I want to read to you some of the women were on their way to the tomb and they were going to embalm Jesus' body because it wasn't completely embalmed. On Friday, they had to put Jesus in the grave because the Sabbath had come and nobody could do anything on the Sabbath. So the women came on Sunday morning and I want you to see what happened. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived... They looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Today, I want to talk to you about rolled away. Would you close your eyes each location? Let me pray. Holy Spirit, anoint this moment. Not just my words, but anoint our hearts to hear and receive it. In fact, will you do this at every location? Put your hand over your heart right here. Will you do it? Just say these simple words as a prayer. Say, Holy Spirit, speak to me this Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name. And everybody shouted, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You saw in the video that there were people who had challenges in their life, had stones that were holding them back. But those stones were rolled away. God is still rolling away stones. Interesting, when Mary's on her way to the tomb, here's what she's thinking Man, there's something standing between me and Jesus. And who's going to remove it? Can I tell you, the story of Easter is, yes, that Jesus is alive. How many are thankful that Jesus is alive? That's a big deal. Why? Because he said he was the son of God. He said that he would rise again. And he backed it up by not just dying on a cross, but rising from the grave. That is a story of Easter. But there's another side of Easter that sometimes we don't focus on. Not only is the message of Easter that Jesus is alive, the message of Easter is that Jesus rolls away the stone. So today I want to take a few minutes. Now I was thinking, somebody say, pastor, why are you coming at it this way? I was thinking and praying before Easter and I started thinking about how the stone had been rolled away. And here's the question I asked myself. I'm like, God, why did you roll away the stone? Because here's the thing. When Jesus rose again, we know that he had a glorified body, meaning it was a lot like our body now, but it had new features and new things to it. You know, the, the way it's like us now is that he showed up to his disciples one morning and he was hungry. So he said, hey, anybody got some chorizo and huevos? I'm, he's like, make me some breakfast. And so they made breakfast and they eat. He was hungry. Uh, remember Thomas came and said, hey, check out the scars. He had scars. But also the Bible tells us that the disciples were in a room one time, the door was locked, and Jesus literally walks through the wall and says, hey guys, I'm here. I mean, no, that's pretty cool. Upgrade. <laughs> so if Jesus could walk through walls, why did God even need to roll away the stone? Jesus could have just walked right on out. And I thought this. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me. Maybe he didn't roll away the stone so that Jesus could get out. Maybe he rolled away the stone so that you and I could walk in. And so today I want to talk to you on the theme, rolled away. Here's three points, all of our locations. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. You ready? Point number one, maybe he rolled away the stone to, ready? Write this down, remove the obstacles. Maybe Jesus rolled away the stone to remove the obstacles. I want to now take this story and read it from John's perspective in the Gospel of John. Look what it says. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. When she saw this stone rolled away, what does she do? Here's what the Bible says. She ran. Everybody say, she ran. she ran. 
She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and he looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. I want to take a minute and talk about this idea of removing the obstacles. First thing is Mary, when she shows up and the stone is rolled away, the first thing she does, and this is, I think, what happens to a lot of people, maybe in their journey of life, and here's what she did. She ran. This is who I would call the runner. (laughs) Have you ever met someone that whenever something goes on, they run? I had a dog that every time the door opened, bam, he was gone. He was the runner. Mary was confused. She didn't understand. Messiahs aren't supposed to die. Things hadn't worked out the way she thought. And so what what does she do? She runs. I'm going to tell you, it's easy in life to do that when we don't understand. Remember Jonah? Jonah, God speaks to him and says, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach the gospel. But he didn't get it because Nineveh was an evil empire. They murdered, they raped, they killed. It was was horrible. He didn't want to go. So what does he do when he doesn't understand? He runs. Maybe today you're here. Maybe you're joining us at a location like Santa Paula or Crescenta Valley. Things have happened in your life you don't understand, and you've been like Mary. You've run. I love to just point out that when you read the story, did you notice that the author of the Gospel of John, which, by the way, you know who the author was? John. (laughs) And you know what's crazy is that when he tells the story that Peter takes off running to the tomb and that he ran with him, he has to make sure that he points out that he got there first. (laughs) He had to point out that he was a runner and he was faster than Peter. Come on, anybody? I just love that part of the story. The runner. Here's the other person in the story. John gets there, but when he gets there, he just looks inside, but he doesn't go in. This is who I'd call the skeptic. Maybe in the Easter story, you're the skeptic, or maybe you know the skeptic. And here's what the skepticism says. I'll just keep my distance. Because if I don't get close, then I won't get hurt. And I've seen people in their journey that don't get too close because if I get too close, it just might cause me pain. Can I just pause and say something? I just want to make an observation. There is a real enemy. Did you know that there is an enemy in this world called Satan? And he doesn't want you to be close to God. He doesn't want you to have a relationship with God. And his job, what he tries to do is he accuses and he tries to keep distance between people and God. He used sin to do that. Remember in the garden, he came as the serpent to to Eve. He said, you don't, you can eat the apple. Don't listen to what God said. And what happens? Because she embraces, she eats the, the, the fruit of the tree. There's distance now between God and between man. One of the things I believe this message of Easter is, is that God is saying this. Listen, I'm removing that separation. First of all, we know that the biggest one is sin because sin distances us from God. And here's what he says. I'm moving away the obstacles and I'm inviting you in. Come on into the tomb and get closer to me. Have a relationship with me. What does the Bible say? Draw close to God and God will draw close to you. You realize you can look in, but never go in. I never forget My family had a chance to go many years ago to Hawaii when my kids were little. And I was speaking at a church. And so they put us up in this hotel and we arrived at night. And when we, we, when the sun came up, you know, it came up and we got up and suddenly, you know, we opened the windows and we opened the windows. It was beautiful. The sun was, you know, rising. The the ocean was right there. And we looked down and there was this little island called Coconut Island. And so as we're looking, we notice that kids are running and climbing up this little building. It's about eight to 10 feet high. And they're just jumping off the building into the water. And they're running and they're jumping up. And my kids are looking at me and they're like, Dad, we got to go there. And so I'm like, okay, after service, we'll go. So I go preach. And afterwards, we come back. We get on our swimsuits. We go out there. And we all climb up on top. And we get out there. And of course, Tanner, the adventurer, he's like, let's do it. He just like goes, ah! And he runs and jumps and his arms flailing and lands in the water. He's like, yeah. And Hudson, he's like, I guess I'm going too. If he goes, I'm going. And then boom, he jumps. And then the girls jump. And they're all in the water and they're laughing. They're like, come on, dad. And it was at that moment I forgot something very important. 
I'm afraid of heights. I know it's only 10 feet, but it felt like 10 miles. And then they're like, dad, dad, jump, dad. And, you know, and I'm just thinking in my mind, I can't do it, I can't do it. But then I'm thinking, they're going to remember this for the rest of their life and give me a hard time. So finally, okay. And I, I'm like, okay, it looks fun, but so I jumped. And when I got to the bottom and I splashed and I came up and like, yeah. And, and then the next thing you know, we're all jumping off. And because here's the point I want to make. Some things are not meant to be explained. They're meant to be experienced. And I'm here to tell you that Easter is not meant to be explained. It's meant to be experienced. Jesus rolled the stone away and he said, come on in, experience the miracle. Come on in, experience my forgiveness. Come on in, experience my peace. I'll illustrate one, one other quick way. And uh, how many here, let me ask this question. Is the hand, go ahead, uh, April, or, uh, Haley. Give it up for Haley. She's been my help, helper today. So I'm gonna do a quick survey at all the locations. How many of you are a Cadbury egg person? Ray, wave at me. Uh, locations, Cadbury egg? Okay, I had this one asked. How many of you are a robin egg person? Okay. How many of you are a Reese's peanut butter cup egg? It always wins. It always wins. I got to tell you, I'm going to ask a question here in a second, but in fact, let me just ask it now. Every location. How many of you have never, ever tried a Reese's peanut butter Easter egg? How many have never tried it? I think they're lying. I'm just telling you. Some things are not meant to be explained. They're meant to be experienced. Come on. Hey, this is my fourth service already. Did I see that you guys have never, one of you, never... Have you ever tried these? I think you guys need to pass it back to them right there so you can experience. Turn to your neighbor and say, Happy Easter. Here's what God's saying. Don't be the skeptic. Don't stand outside the tomb. Come on in. I've removed the obstacles. Listen, no stone is too big. No question is too big. No trial is too big. No no disappointment is too big. Mary didn't have even faith. Maybe your doubt seems too low, like that your faith isn't big enough. Mary, the first thing she thought, even though Jesus had told her three different times, and all the disciples, I'm going to be turned over to the, to the, uh, the leaders. They're going to kill me but I'm going to rise again three times. And yet the first response was they've stolen the body. It's amazing how sometimes disappointments and things in life can cause us to to run. Here's the question for every location. Hear me. Are you farther from Jesus than you should be? Maybe it's only two feet, just the other side of the rock. Maybe it's two miles. Maybe, let's talk about it in some of you in time. Maybe it's two years. And you're farther today because you haven't pressed in. Kind of reminded me of, you know, back in the day, you know, they used to do at church these, you know, illustrated things where they have mime dancers and they would do stuff. Remember the, remember the mimes that would paint their face and, and then they would do this, right? They would, can I hand you my phone? Would you just hold that for me? Thank you so much. I'm going to have you come up and preach in just a second. No, not really. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. So he's like, man, I shouldn't have sat in the front row. No, seriously. Have you ever seen the mimes and they're like, come on, you might know what I'm talking about. Some of you are like, Good. that's pretty amazing, Pastor Jared. It's not. It's super easy. But have you ever seen them do that? And here's the interesting thing about it. Here's the interesting thing. The wall isn't really there in case you haven't figured it out yet. It's, it's imaginary. Thank you so much. Here here was what I was thinking. Maybe today the stone is not there, but you've created one. And Jesus is saying, listen, whether you created it or life created it, 
or disappointment created it. I am a God who rolls the stone away. Come on in to the tomb. Come on, somebody say amen. Here's the second point. Not only does the the stone get rolled away, maybe to remove the obstacles, but maybe it's this, to reveal the evidence. High Vision Blythe, to reveal the evidence. I I want to go back to the story in John again. Look what it says. Remember, Mary runs, gets Peter and John, and says they've taken the body. And look what it says. Then Simon arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, by the way, did you notice he threw it in again? (laughs) To say, by the way, you guys know I'm faster than Peter. (laughs) Then the disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. This was the one that got there and looked but didn't go in. But when Peter got there and went in, he went in saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understand the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. I love it. It's so Peter. He gets there and he just barrels into the tomb. And here's what he's saying. I'm going to see for myself. I'm going to figure this out. I want to examine the evidence. Have you ever had something and you looked at and you're like, I could figure that out. I I thought that back in the day with something called the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> Anybody here ever tried a Rubik's Cube? And when you looked at it, you're like, that doesn't look hard. You just move them around, and then that's what you do. You start moving them around, moving them around, and then you get it all done, and you look, and you're like, how did that one color get right there in the middle that's different than the rest? So like, it's easy, I'll fix it. And then you keep doing it, and the next thing you know, it's on the other side. <laughs> I was so irritated because I couldn't do it, and, and so I, was, I got one when I was a little older, and my kids are young, and I'm like, I can't figure this out. And so I'm like, Hudson, can you figure this out? So my, my youngest, I just gave it to him. And I remember I'm sitting there, whoops, I'm sitting there and I'm like working on it. And I mean, I, I don't know how long it went, half an hour, 45 minutes. And, and that's exactly what he does. Whoop. Good job, Hudson. Give it up for Hudson. Interesting. Can I, can I make a point? It's easy to believe your theory if you never look at the evidence. We can look at situations and think, well, I'll never figure that out. Or look at situations and say, that's too hard for me. Or look at situations and say, you know what? I think I know best. I think I could figure that out. I think I know what's going on. But what I love about the story is that in the Bible, they document their unbelief. And they go into the tomb and they go, I don't get it. But I want to look at the evidence. And what's interesting is they, the Bible says that Peter went in and he noticed the linen wrappings. The word notice, you know what it is? It's a Greek word, which means to scrutinize. Listen, God's not afraid of you scrutinizing the evidence. He's not afraid. What does the Bible say? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He wants you to try him out. He wants you to put your toes into the water. He wants you to take an opportunity to to taste and, and check it out. And that's what Peter does. He walks in. And here's what's interesting. He sees all the loose garments laying there where Jesus' body was. And then they see the garment over his head is folded up. And here's what's interesting about that. In that culture, when you went to a, another Jewish person's home for a meal, at the end of the meal, your napkin, if you took your napkin and kind of wadded it up and threw it on the table and you left, here's what they knew. They're done and they're not coming back. But if you took the napkin and you folded it up, then it meant, I haven't finished yet, there's more. More. And when he walks into the tomb and he sees not only the the clothes over his body that are all there, he sees the folded neck and suddenly he remembers the words of Jesus and he remembers, wait a minute, there's evidence here. Jesus hasn't finished. What he started is being completed. He is coming back for us. Can I tell you, God's journey for you isn't over. He's inviting you in. You see, here's the point. Investigation brings revelation. You can trust the word. I'm going to tell you, I'm standing here today as a testament that I have tasted 
his goodness, and I'm telling you, it is good. I am a person who testifies that I have read his word, and it's not some outdated, you know, strict, a book of, of words that was changed over and over by different scholars. No, it is the same then. It is the same today. The power that it had then is still powerful today. I have tasted and I have seen. I have seen his miracles. I have experienced his forgiveness. I have walked in his peace, and here's what this story is all about. Jesus is saying, I moved the stone away so that you can come on in, come into the tomb and check it out. Come into the tomb and experience what I have waiting for you. Somebody shout amen. Amen. God rolled the stone away so you could see for yourself. Do you realize tombs normally are meant to be closed because of the decay? But Jesus said, we're not closing this tomb. Maybe you've been the skeptic. Maybe you've been the John that's been looking, but you haven't taken that step. Maybe at one day you did have a relationship with the Lord, but because of situations you've run and now you're farther than you should be, Jesus is calling you back. In fact, here's what's crazy about the story. If you go down a little farther, it says, then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, John, by the way, I'm faster than Peter, (laughs) also went in. And he saw and believed. I just want to make one last point on this. John was the skeptic. But Peter barged in. And and because Peter went in, John followed him. I want to give a shout out to dads. I want to give a shout out to moms. I want to give a shout out to students. I want to give a shout out to teachers. I want to give a shout out to you. Maybe There's a whole group of people that are waiting for you to charge into that tomb and to see for yourself and to have an experience with God. Why? So that they will follow you. So they'll discover, listen, God wants to use you to lead others to a place of hope and healing and freedom. So listen, enter, come on in. He has rolled the stone away. Here's the last point I want to bring to you. He he removed the obstacles. He revealed the evidence. And here's the third thing, I think, of why he rolled the stone away. To restore your hope. Arizona, would you write that down or repeat it? All of our locations, restore your hope. I want to show you this part of the story. We go continue in John and go to verse 10. Then they went home. So Peter and John goes home. Mary stays there. She's standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept... She stooped and looked in, and she saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Interesting, verse 4, it says, she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, If you've taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. And then I want you to see what happened. Jesus says, Mary. He calls her name. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Interesting. Here's what really struck me is that Mary, Mary knew Jesus. She was the one that had been set free from all that demonic influence. She's the one that followed with Jesus, served with Jesus for over three years, and yet how could this woman not recognize Jesus? As I was thinking about it, I I thought of maybe an illustration to explain it, and it made me think back in the day. So when I was young, um, it was back in the day when they hadn't really, you know, fine-tuned glasses in a way where if you had bad eyesight, my dad had terrible eyesight, and so back in the day, in order to see, it was like thick old bottle, you know, the top, the bottoms of a bottle. I mean, it was magnifying glasses. You might know what I'm talking about. In fact, I found a picture. I was going to try to find a picture of my dad in these glasses. And the only one I could find showed the whole family. So I'm just going to say this picture is when I was in high school. And as they say in Nacho Libre, stop judging me. Okay. So, cause I want to see your picture from when you were in high school. So here it is. And, um, that, that's me right there, and you're wondering what that hairdo is. I have no idea. That was 
something that was, I don't know if it was cool when I was in high school, but I want you to notice my dad. And, and you can kind of see from the, the, the light on the side how thick his glasses are. They're just massive thick. His eyes weren't very good. You guys, you can take that down. Here's what's interesting. <laughs> so the first time that I was a kid, and I remember, I was like, oh, my dad's glasses. I was like, I want to you know, be like dad. or I wanna, you know. And so I grabbed his glasses, and I put them on. Now, these aren't his glasses, but I put them on, and the moment I put them on, my world changed <laughs> because I couldn't see anything. <laughs> I put my hand up, and it was like I had five hands. They were all... <laughs> Everything was blurry. Everything was distorted. And as I thought about it, and I thought about Mary, why didn't she recognize Jesus? Well, how about this? What you see is always influenced by the lens you're looking through. And as I thought about Easter, and I thought about this moment where she's so discouraged that Mary couldn't recognize Jesus. Why? Because she'd fallen victim to her pain. She'd fallen victim to her hopelessness. She'd fallen victim to her discouragement. She'd fallen victim to her grief. And now she couldn't even recognize Jesus who was right there. And I just thought about how we live in a world right now that's trying to get people to focus on their trauma, trying to get people to focus on the fact you're a victim. And the next thing you know, if you're not careful, now let me say to qualify, things happen in life and we need to deal with those and we need to work on those. But if we're not careful, we'll live in a place where we're wearing the wrong set of glasses because all we see is we see through our pain, we see through our trauma, we see through our situations. And then the sad thing is we don't recognize that Jesus is right there next to the tomb reaching out to us. But I love it because Jesus, the first thing he does is he says, I want you to identify your glasses. He says, why are you crying? Jesus is not trying to just say, you know, don't worry about your pain. Don't deny it. Don't deflect it. Acknowledge it. I want to, in this Easter Sunday, Jesus says, I want you to point out and identify your pain. And then as soon as you do, what does he say? Mary. And here's what it said to me. Jesus is saying this Easter, listen, I rolled the stone away so that I could come to you. I could call your, I could call your name and, and I could say to you, I see you. You're not walking through life alone. We, we have family here today that lost someone that they love. It's been a part of this church for many years. This is a, a, a bittersweet weekend. The, the good news is that when we die, sometimes that's sad because there's loss. But how many know death when it comes to being a Christian isn't goodbye, it's I'll see you later. Why? Because Jesus, he sees you. He sees your pain. He sees your trial. He sees your trauma. He sees what you walk through. And he's wanting you to know, listen, I see it. Make sure you understand. Take the glasses off and recognize that you are not alone. I have come to remove the obstacles, to remove your hopelessness, to remove your fear, to heal your grieving heart, and to restore to you hope in a hopeless situation. Literally, the place of her brokenness became the place of her miracle. Jesus rolls away the stone so that the place of death can become the place of life. So the place of lost can be the place of being found. Today, Jesus is inviting, is inviting you into the tomb to remove the obstacles and to bring hope to your life. You know, there's an old song that we used to sing in kids' church, going old school here. And how many know with kids' church, when you sing these old songs, that you always put motions to them for kids? Because if you don't, they forget the words and they get lost or they quit paying attention. And so we used to sing this old song. It goes like this. If you, if you know it, um, you can sing along with me. It goes, God's not dead. He's still alive. God's not. How many have, have heard of this song? Wave at me. How many have no idea what I'm talking about? All the locations have no idea. Wait, wait, wait. You have no. Okay, that's okay. So here, how's, here's how it goes. God's not dead. 
He's still alive. I can feel him in. We do this. I feel him in my hands. I feel him in my feet. And then we go, I feel him all over me. I don't know if we did it quite like that, but I was feeling it right now. I feel him all over me. You can feel him all over you. You can feel him in your pain. You can feel him in your doubt. You can feel him at your distance. You can feel him in your hopelessness. He is still, you saw the video, he's still rolling stones away today. There is no stone too big for God. And he's welcoming you in.